song this morning that was telling us all the different names of God. And as we were singing that song this morning, I was thinking about how we were singing about His promises that He makes to us. All these things that He will be to us and, and for us. And everything that we, we sung about and everything that we read about Him being that for us, there, there is a proposition there. And it's always Him saying, if you keep my commandments, if you act on my commandments, if you put in to motion the things that I am asking you to do, then I will be this for you. And there's times in our life where we don't have the strength to be anything other than just His, right? You ever been there before? For you didn't have the strength to be anything but just His. And I like, I like that as we sung and we worshipped this morning together, talking about the names of God or the names of Jesus, that it brought to our minds what He wants to be for us. So this morning, before I preach this message, as we have this fresh on our mind, we've got just a short snippet that we're going to play for you. And we want you to understand that not everybody knows what you know. And we need to let this sink into our hearts and into our minds as we have just stood and worshiped together with love, knowing that we have an Almighty Father that loves us and cares about us, that there are people that don't yet recognize that. So let's watch this together before we preach. I'd like to think Jesus is a great person. Uh, I just, I, it's, a, it's to me, it's a silly story. Jesus was the shepherd who basically was the leader of the pack and told people what to do. He would probably be the guy that I walked by and thought he was a homeless bum and ignored him, honestly. I'm sure that he would be saying something really profound and I'm afraid I might be ignoring it. I don't necessarily believe that any one person is God. I don't think that Jesus may have been God. However, I do believe that we all have divinity within us. I'm just trying to do the best I can down here. I, I, I believe it, that uh, the teachings of Jesus, uh, they ring true to me. This, the way, it makes sense to live that way, to, to love people instead of hate people, to, to look out for your fellow man instead of always trying to beat him down. wasn't white, <laughs> so I don't think that you could say that he's just here for white middle class people. Uh, if he really existed, I'm all for it. Um, too bad that there is no other people that, like him nowadays. Jesus, I believe, was a liberal, and I think looking at where we're going, I think he'd be happy to see that people are becoming more and more accepting. Sure, I believe that Jesus was a historical person, um, but I don't believe the, the other things that have accrued around the story of his life. He's, he's like the pinnacle of love. It's idolization, basically. The idea that there's a human being that can be viewed as a god is, 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 is a tough, um, tough proposition for me to accept. Jesus, he loves people and he wants people in his family and he's not someone that pushes people outside, he's always inviting people in. Si Jesus ay anak ng Diyos na namatay para sa atin, para tubusin uh, tayo sa mga kasalanan at para makarating tayo sa langit. I think I'm, I grow more curious about that every day um, uh, and, and how I can be a better person uh, maybe by following his teachings and, and maybe it will be a, a fit for me and maybe it won't, but you know, well, I have a lifetime to figure that out. She says she has a lifetime to figure that out. How many of us know if we're going to live tomorrow? So here's why I want to share with you this morning. And, and this is true from my heart to yours. Oh yes, dismissed the children's church. Got carried away. As they are going out, I want you to listen to me. 
what we have done today, this thing that we called coming to church, if this was at the beginning of a, if we had a scale that showed just beginning, and then on this side, being with God, what we do when we're in these four walls is just the beginning. What we do, this, this thing we call coming to church, if this cannot be the highest point of our worship every week. And here's what I mean by that. Our life cannot be geared so that coming to church makes us feel as though we have received a reward. Because we come to church to learn what we need to do to go out and to impact those people. That we just saw on that video. That's the thing that we have to keep mindful in us. That in our own community. This week. I rode a mile this way. I rode a mile that way. I rode down every road that's connected to this road. Within a mile there are 74 houses. Around this church. In a one mile radius. And I guarantee you. That at some of those houses. You will get some of the same answers. That you heard on that video. Because we live in, even though it says 67% of Americans call themselves Christians or believe that Jesus was here, it doesn't say that they are a walking in a relationship with Jesus Christ, did it? And we live in a post-biblical world in the United States today where over the last 20 to 30 years, that mindset of knowing that God is sovereign and that Jesus is our Redeemer is no longer in the minds or the hearts of our neighbors that are out there. So as we come to church and we enjoy the presence of God's Spirit, that should fuel us and get us ready to go out throughout the week to be that salt and the light that they sang about this morning. And to depend on that God. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Is depending upon the authority of God in your daily walk. So this morning I want to share an analogy with you. If, if you were in your car. And I came up behind you in something gray and black. With blue lights flashing. And I pulled you over. And I walked up beside of you wearing the gray and the black. And I had my badge. What does that represent to you? It represents authority. Now that badge that he has. Regardless of whether that's a North Carolina State Highway Patrolman. Or whether it's a Pender County Sheriff's Department. Or a Burgall Police Department. They all have a badge. And that badge in and of itself is a symbol of authority. But what stands behind that badge is where the authority comes from. Because behind that badge is a whole force of law enforcement for good. And behind that badge are judges, local judges. There are judges for the state. There are judges for our country. And all of that stands behind that one guy that walks right up to your car and stands there and says, can I have your license and registration, please? All of that behind that one badge is authority. And what I want you to understand this morning is when Jesus wants us to go out and be his missionary in our day-to-day -day life, we need to understand that he gives us authority, just like that law enforcement officer. He doesn't know what he's going to come up against when he walks up to that car. But he is certain that he has the authority and the training to do whatever it takes to get the job done. This morning, do you understand that you have the authority? You have the opportunity to have the training to get God's job done through Jesus Christ. This morning, this is really tender on my heart because I see people that are in need here in our town. 
Uh, just this past week, I, I learned of even more homeless people here in Burgal. Uh, I learned of a man in Willard that kept a woman and child held captive in his home and was arrested for that. And there are all kinds of things going on in the name of Satan. And we need to be about our Father's business. And we don't need to let all these other distractions slow us down because there is a work that we all need to do. Turn with me this morning to John chapter 15. And I want to read one verse to you. And then I want to ask a few questions. This is a very important verse. And this verse... um, starts to tell us about a relationship that Jesus has with His disciples, but He also offers that relationship to us as believers as well. He says, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. I want you to know this morning that if you are a child of God, if you have accepted Jesus Christ, He is making all things known to us through His Word and through His Spirit. And He calls you friend this morning. And because of that, because you are a friend of Jesus, you have an authority that is not your own. Do you recognize that this morning? Who you are in Jesus Christ? I ask this question, how many of you believe that we can be impactful in evangelism only as we hear and see Jesus in our own daily lives. How many of us believe that we can be impactful in evangelism, but it's only as we hear and see Jesus in our daily lives? That daily relationship to get closer to Him, to say, God, whatever is on your heart, I want it to be on my heart. We're going to read a verse here in a moment that tells us anything that we ask, He will give it to us. But there is yet another clause that goes with that. Our heart has got to be His heart before we can ask for those things and see those things given. So as we are thinking about these things, we need to understand that we are covered and we are protected under the shepherd that we call Jesus Christ. And His authority. So let's bow our heads and let's ask God to let that sink into us this morning. Lord Jesus, as we have come this morning and we have had the opportunity to worship You. Lord, to begin to understand who You are in song. Now, Lord, You give us the opportunity to understand who You are in Your Word. And Father, we are so thankful And blessed that we have had these opportunities today. And Lord, I pray now that we will make the most of it. I pray, Lord, that you will just help us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that today, I pray, Lord, that we will make up our minds to faithfully partner with you, Jesus. And to understand the authority that is given to us in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you will help us to remember... That it's just our job to go where you're leading. But Lord, it's not our job to turn hearts and minds. It's your job to release the authority to turn hearts and minds. It's just for us to go and be what you're asking us to be. So Lord, with that being said, I pray that your spirit, Lord, would work as he always does. And Lord, our hearts have already been prepared this morning. We have no excuses, Lord, because we have... Lifted up our voices, Lord, and we have sung to your heart, telling you, Lord, who you are and what you mean to us. So I pray, Lord, now that we will put action to our words, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here in John chapter 15, I want to share verses 7 and 8 with you, because we have been studying this a lot around this church. It's Jesus talking about him being, God being the vine dresser. And he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire 
and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. I want you to see this morning what that scripture says. It's talking about us bearing fruit. Now that means, bearing fruit don't mean just coming to church. As I said, coming to church is just the beginning of that. This is where we come to say, Brother Chris, I sure am glad to see you today. I really appreciate what you do in that nursery taking care of our kids. And I love you. If there's anything I can do for you, just let me know. I'm praying for you and your family. And I look forward to worshiping with you today. It's a place where we come and we encourage one another. It's a place where we come and we sing God's praises. But it's, to, it's like a pep rally for Jesus to get ready for the week. To get ready for the war that comes at each and every one of us. Who in here is going through a war right now in some way in your life? Raise your hand. Be honest. A great deal of the people that are in here. Amen, brother. I see that hand out there in the foyer. The key to asking is knowing what to ask for. And here's what he does. He offers us a relationship this morning. He offers us teaching this morning. He offers us words of music this morning to know who he is so that we can draw near to his heart so our heart will be the same. And then, and only then, Rodney Garner, will we know what to ask for. We need that close relationship with Him to know what to ask for. You know, this morning we were sitting in Sunday school and there was a verse that was posed. And um, it comes from the book of Proverbs. And I love this verse because I've read it so many times and it is so true. But here in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, Brother Trevor brought up to us, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on whose understanding? Your own understanding. Here's what I want to tell you. There's been generation after generation of churches that have taught people how to try to be effective. Now let that sink in. There's been methods of how to do things prepared on how to be effective. Yet we still have people in our community that have answers like this. So let me ask you a question. How effective is the church? I mean, let's just be honest this morning. How effective are you? Because you're the church. How effective am I as the shepherd of the church? Because scriptures tell us that if my heart is not God's heart, I can't be effective. Because I can't go out in the community and do things within my own power. Patsy, I can't go out there and just follow something that it says from a church website that this is how you do it. I've got to know my people. I've got to know my community. I've got to be prayed up. I've got to be worshipped up. I've got to know God's heart. And you have too. And we can't be trusting in our own understanding because if we do, we're never going to do it God's way. We're never going to make that impact that Scripture is telling us about here. So turn with me this morning to the Gospel of Luke. And this is where the, the guts of our sermon come from this morning. Um, and I want to share something about Jesus sending, some scriptures say 70, some say 72. And I want you to put yourself in the position of these people. These are people just like you. They have been walking with Jesus. They have been hearing His Word. And now Jesus is prepared them to go out before Him. And to go into the towns that he's getting ready to go into, two by two, and to speak to people. And there's a few things I want to bring out in this scripture this morning that are beneficial to all of us. Look with me here in Luke chapter 10, verse 1 through 16. 
I want to read through and then I want to go back and I want to dissect a few of those verses. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before His face into every city and place where He Himself was about to go. Then He said to them, The harvest truly is great. Folks, the harvest truly is great in Pender County. It is truly great in Burgall. It is truly great one mile around this church. The harvest is truly great. But he says the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, nor knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this home. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. Can you imagine if we walked down the road today and we knocked on the door, we walked up and said, Is this a house of peace? What kind of response we would get? They'd be calling Dix Hill in Raleigh, wouldn't they? There's some fool outside my door asking if this is a house of peace. It just tells you how different our cultures are. But I'm going to tie this in so that we'll understand how we can use that today, okay? Don't let it scare you. People are just people. We're all the same, and we were once there too. But he says here, and if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you and remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. And whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. And then he says, and heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Let me ask you this. How could he send these 70 out if they didn't have the authority and tell them to heal the sick? And then to tell them about him. The kingdom of God is at hand. They had the authority of Jesus on them. It says, but whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, the very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near to you. But I say to you that it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for this city. Now what happened to Sodom? It pretty much got stoned from the heavens with fiery rocks and destroyed, right? And he's saying that it would be better for Sodom who got that punishment than for people who don't want to hear about Jesus Christ. That's pretty stout, isn't it? And then it says, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. All these places around Jerusalem. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. He who hears, your, who, he who hears you, hears me. And he who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. Now, I want you to notice in this scripture that we've read that first of all, in verse 1, it says that he sent them two by two. Do you know why he sent them two by two? Why do you think he sent them two by two? I'm I'm not fishing for a right or wrong answer. I just want to understand. Mike, what do you think? Let me ask you this. Did you come here to encourage us today? All right. Jesus knew in our human frailty that we're not on par every day. But He was still sending you out even if you didn't feel on par. 
And there's going to be days, George Curran, as you as my neighbor, that you're going to call me up and I'm not going to sound fired up. I'm going to sound plumb depressed. And then what your job is, is to say, you know what? Jesus gave us authority. Jesus loves you and me. There's a work to be done, brother. Don't bear the load because Jesus bears the load for us. And you're going to encourage me. And I'm going to get up. And I'm going to walk forward. That's why Jesus sent them two by two. Two by two. If you're the lone ranger in here or the lone wolf that likes to do everything by yourself because you can't get along with no one else, you're not doing it God's way. Two by two. Because we all need encouragement, don't we? Is there anybody in here that don't need encouragement? If you don't, you can leave right now. Because what we need to hear today is that Jesus is our power. He is our strength. He is our encourager. And He wants to be that for us. So if one was weak, the other one wasn't. He sent them out. You know, we remember in the story of Paul and Silas... They were sitting there in the jail cell, and we read the part about both of them singing. But they were there, two at a time, were they not? Why? To encourage one another. So we should be encouraging one another when we're at God's house and when we're not. Now look with me in verses 2 and 3 what it says. Then he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send laborers. The first thing that he asked them to do after he sent them two by two is to pray and then go out. One of our biggest downfalls is going at things wholehearted, thinking we're doing it God's way when we haven't prayed about it. And if we don't pray about it, how can we know? How can we be led by his spirit on the way that we should go? We're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. Of not praying about things in my life. But here specifically, pray before you go out and you greet these people. Then in verse 4, he says this. He says, don't fend for yourselves and don't use your own means. Don't take a money bag. Don't take clothes. Don't greet somebody on the road and start telling them about what you're doing. Go where I'm sending you like a sheep amongst the wolves. Make yourself vulnerable. Boy, that is a hard thing right there, isn't it? How many of us in here like to feel like we're in control? I can lift both hands to that one. How about you? How many of us in here want to feel like we just want to open up the door and say, I don't know what's going to happen, and I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to even worry about it, and I'm not going to prepare myself for this. Uh, I see people smiling in here. I see some heads bobbing because people are going, that is just not the way that we live. But he says, make yourself vulnerable. Because why? You're in my authority. Not under your own authority. I think that's one of the biggest things that the church has done wrong over the years. We've tried to reach people in our own authority. Instead of in Jesus Christ's authority. And because of that we think we can just fly in. And spend ten minutes with somebody. And say you're saved. Pat them on the back. Never see them again. And we feel good about ourselves. And we count the numbers. Christianity went up in 2019. I really believe that that's something that we have room to work on as we move forward. And all I can be accountable for is this church and for you. So if you get tired of me saying that, that's just what the Lord has laid on my heart. If you're praying for me that I'll share with you what the Lord's laying on my heart, that's what He's laying on my heart. That we've been doing it wrong. And now it's time for us to start making it more human. 
making it the approach more simple, making it more personal. And that means I have to improve on that also. So we see here, as they're not fending for themselves, as they're not using their means, he says in verse 5 and 6 simply this. He says, go to them, and in, in layman's terms, if the person is peaceful and has a kind disposition, go into their home. Now, I know and you know that there are people that we encounter, even in church, that do not have a kind disposition, right? I mean, there, there's, I was sitting in a meeting uh, about a week ago with our long-term recovery group, and this lady from Pender County Schools got up and she spoke about something, and somebody else in that room who stands in the same position that I stand in stood up and was as abrasive as could be toward someone who's trying to help a flooded family. And I thought to myself, how can this be? But that was this guy's personality. And when he was over with, I went and I sat down behind, beside of her. And I said, you didn't say anything wrong. That's just who this guy is. And she says, well, he needs to work on his personality. <laughs> it's sad when God's people aren't even peaceful people, isn't it? When we don't have a kind disposition toward one another, but... If we can find a household that don't know Jesus, that welcomes us in with a kind disposition, we can infiltrate that house. And that's what we see in the scripture. They went into a house. They made friends with the people. They ate their food. They stayed with them. They didn't move from house to house trying to gain things for themselves. They stood there and they became a part of the family. And when people figured out, Todd, that they weren't much different, they started to listen to what Christians had to say. And as Christians talked about what was on God's heart with them and they didn't criticize them and didn't run them down for what they, who they were and what they were doing and didn't pick out every little thing that they thought they were wrong about, they started to accept Jesus Christ. And that's going to be the same thing that we must do in loving people. But then in verse 7 and 8, he simply says that we need to remain or we need to abide. Stay there. Invest time. Be me with them. Because what you're saying are my words. And what they're hearing is my words. And if they are rejecting it, they're rejecting me. They're not rejecting you. Why do we as Christians stop telling people about Jesus? It's because we don't like rejection. But if we understand that we walk in His authority and that the words that are coming out of our mouth are His words, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Him. And that's a sad thing, but it should allow you to keep going and doing what He's asking you to do and not taking it personally. Now, I want to close today by reading these other two scriptures quickly, and I want you just to listen. Here in Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20, these 70 return, and listen to what it says about them. When they went and did it Jesus' way and His authority. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in Your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and all over the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. But rather rejoice because your name is written in heaven. Do you rejoice today because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life? Because that's what the scripture says we should be rejoicing in. Yes, it is amazing when God uses us in a power that we don't have in our own. I mean, I would love to go to the hospital with you, Jason. 
and walk down the hallway and us lay hands on people and them just start rolling out of the hospital beds ready for discharge. Because you know that wouldn't be you. And I would know that's not me. We would know that's the power of God. But he says, don't get so wrapped up in what you can do with me or for me, but get joyful that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. If we're joyful about that, we'll have a fire in us to want to do the other things that he's calling us to do. Whether it be singing, or whether it be a homeless ministry, whether it be teaching Sunday school, whether it be out giving uh, people assistance in the neighborhood, no matter what it is. But lastly, I want to share this verse with you from the book of John, chapter 16, verse 8. Oh, we have such a wonderful Savior, don't we? And when He has come, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me. It does not say Roger has to convict the people of Burgal of their sin. Jesus will convict people of their sin. All I've got to do is be a part of people's lives that don't know Jesus. I simply ask you this as you stand with me this morning. God says in the Old Testament that I am, right? And if we think about Him saying I am, that means He is everything. Is God everything to you this morning? All right, so if He's everything to you and you're in a relationship with Him, then let me ask you this. Will you be? Simply that. Will you be? And you can put anything after that be that He's calling you to be. Because He's not going to ask us all to do the same things. He's not going to ask me to do something that He's asking Rick to do. He's just not. And Derek's going to do different things than what I do too. But will you allow Him to be whatever it is that He calls you to be in your life? And will you walk in His authority in your life, in your day-to-day -day life, as you encounter other people? You're not going to go live in someone else's house here in Burgos. But you certainly can make friends with them. This week, well, let me just share. I came to this town in November. It'll be, well, actually, first time I preached was in August or September of 2014. I didn't know a soul down here. I was intimidated. Only people I knew was my deacons, the ones that were asking me if I would come and be the pastor here. But as I started to go out into this community, and I started to meet people, and I know a lot more people in this community than what's in this church house right now that either go to church elsewhere or they don't go to church, period. But as I started to be in their life and started to try to interject Jesus Christ in their life, I saw some interesting things start to happen. They wanted to be with me. It wasn't that I just wanted to be with them. And there's a particular person that I have been talking to and sharing Jesus with. And I've invited to church. And I want you to know that I praise Jesus that this week he asked me to go have lunch with him at Mima's Chicken and Barbecue. It's taken about three years of me seeing this person once a week. Where do you go once a week that you talk to somebody that's not a part of your family, that's not a part of your church, that's not a part of what you think church is? And how can you be Jesus in that person's life? So this morning, I'm going to ask you guys to come back, and if you'll just play something for me. As we contemplate, will you be 
this person, like the 70 that Jesus sent out. Will you realize that it's not in your authority, but it's in His authority? And will you let Him use you for His plans and for His purposes? So that, Wendy, when you ask something, that it would be in His name and in His heart, and then you would see it happen. And it would build your faith and make you want to go another day as one of His seven. Will you simply be this morning? What's keeping you from going out to these 74 houses over the next couple Sunday nights? What's keeping you from talking to that person at the restaurant that you see every week? The person at the bank? The person that you drop your kids off at school with? I mean, for goodness sakes, you drop the most precious cargo you have in your life off with this person that you don't even know whether they're a Christian or not and you let them walk your children into the schoolhouse don't you think it would be worth it to find out who they are and what they believe and whether they love the same Jesus that you love wow if we think about it that way it becomes very important to us doesn't it very personal so this morning We all should be around the altar because there's times when we just don't want to be. There's times when we know we should be. But will you be? I promise if you come and you ask God to help you be, you won't be up here alone. It'll be like a dam breaking. There'll be one that'll come and then there'll be another one. See, here comes one. There's a hole in the dam, folks. Will you be for your Lord and Savior? Because you're the only one that's keeping Him from being that in your life. He's wanting to give you authority to walk out what it is that's His plans and purposes. And another comes. And another comes.